Well, it looks like we're live. Sorry, guys, there's a huge delay in this. I don't know if the audio is even going to match what you guys can see or not. Thanks, Mopar Madman. That was pretty cool. <laughs> nice, Jack. Yeah, that's, uh, as I was trying to get this thing set up, I... Didn't realize I was streaming myself on the couch with my laptop trying to get it set up. That's hilarious. So we'll just wait for a few more folks to join us here. While we're waiting, I gotta grab two things. Give me a second. And I'm back. Yeah, Jack, nothing from Snap-on is cheap. It's all expensive, unfortunately. But there's some pretty good calipers. I'd still recommend them. Hey, West Desert Shooter, right on. You found me. I'll just say it right up front. I'm sorry if this thing is, uh, if the audio drops or the, or the video messes up, it's got a huge delay in it and I can't seem to get it fixed. I, it could just be my internet. Nine right now. People are still coming on. This way. So, uh, hey Jack, you you sent a message in about uh, my favorite non-essential reloading tool. I took notes. So to answer that, my favorite non-essential is going to be the RCBS, or actually any Lee, like a Lee decapping die, RCBS decapping die. Um, and the reason for that, the reason I would consider it non-essential is because it is, uh, you know, just a, a full-length sizing die or even a neck sizing die accomplishes the same thing. The reason I like this is just because um, I'm not getting the dies real dirty because the case isn't making contact. It's simply just decapping it so that I can get those cases cleaned up and 
uh, they they keep my my regular dies a lot cleaner so that's uh that's why I like that as the non essential Mopar Madman, I did not realize that there was an average 15 second delay. That's crazy. Um, huh. Last time we did this, it was like just two or three seconds. It was pretty fast. So... I guess we'll just jump right in. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm really tired, guys. It's been a long, long weekend, a lot of work and stuff. Um, I was kind of hoping that to have a few more people on here, but that's all right. So, uh, so Sean wrote in and asked a question about, uh, you know, does basically does standard deviation and extreme spread really matter that much when you're shooting? Um, you know, 100 yards to medium range. And, you know, no, not really. Uh, if you're shooting, uh, you know, if you're shooting real close, I'd say out to about 400 yards, standard deviation and extreme spread really don't amount to much. It's really when you start getting out, you know, 1,000 yards, uh, 800 yards and beyond, uh, that's when you can have a lot of stringing. I shot a 7 millimeter that I was having some trouble getting some reloads to, to get those spreads down. And it was, uh, uh, I was stringing those pretty bad. I was getting about a hundred feet per second difference, uh, on the high side between shots, which was just crazy. And it was, it was, it had to do with the powder, but, uh, anyways, we got that dialed in, but yeah, I'd say, I'd say, you know, it's all out to 400 yards. It doesn't really matter that much. Now, will it matter a little bit? Yeah, it will, but it's not that bad. My little shooter wants to say hi. This is Cody. It's a delay. Can't see yet. Just pretend you're here. <laughs> he's my little. Uh, he's my little tack driver with a 22 and 243. Yay! Oh, I am not reading, I'm not getting into politics. I've got my own opinions. Um, I don't like politics. I'm not going to dis discuss politics or religion, so I'm going to pretend I didn't see that comment. All right, on to the next thing. Um, so, uh, Tim wrote in about um, talking about some 223 barrel twists and bullet weights and shapes. And I'm, I've actually got an entire uh, kind of a mini series coming up on that. And we'll really kind of dive into that. But uh, for just doing a live thing, unfortunately, Tim, it would take me forever. And quite honestly, I'm not really prepared with all the different options of bullets to lay out here in front of us and and kind of get a zoom in picture of all that it's just it would be pretty rough and I was supposed to have uh, my wife here reading the comments and this was supposed to go a little different but we're making the best of it so but Tim I, I do I actually do have that on my list um, and we're I've got some kind of some show and tell stuff with some barrels that we cut open and so we're gonna show you guys some of that stuff too it should be pretty good And somebody else wrote in about installing a barrel on a Remington. Um, do I know how to do it? Yes, but I don't have the machining tools to do it with. And so uh, that would be pretty tough for me to do. Uh, I, there's a good chance. I've got a really good friend of mine. Uh, he's a gunsmith up in Shelton. Well, I, I guess I shouldn't call him a good friend. He's an acquaintance of my gunsmith. Um, but uh, really sharp dude. 
and we may actually be able to go up there and do some video on that. And he's done a lot of Remington work and a lot of Ruger work and stuff like that. I like to focus on the Savages um, and just simply because uh, you, the average person can do them in the garage and it, it, doesn't, it's, it doesn't take a lot to do and it's pretty easy to learn. So that's why I, I kind of stick to that. Uh, half dollar, you did not miss the conversation on, uh, on any rifle stock discussion. We're, I've, I've actually got that on my list. I wrote that down. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, Mopar Madman, what's coming up on the channel? So let me show you. Well, let me, let me say something first. I've actually got, um, I've got some things in the work right now that I can't really talk about, uh, but it's going to be pretty exciting, I think. Um, but there's some contractual stuff in there that will just, uh, it's coming up, but yes, that'll be exciting. But I have some other stuff too. So I don't know how many folks out there are familiar with this, but this is a machine from Anneli's. Uh, Jeff Buck out of Florida designed these things. And I've been running it, running some 243 Ackley through it. And that stuff is turning out just beautiful. And he sent this to us to test. So I'm going to get some uh, video of this shot. And there's also some adjustments here on the wheels. Uh, but it's adjusted from the back end. And we're going to talk about that. It's a, it's a real common misstep with these things. And uh, actually, Jeff asked me to shoot a video on this showing how to adjust that to help out uh, the customers that are buying these. And this machine... It rocks. Let me tell you, it, this thing is awesome. And I'm not just saying that because Jeff sent it to me. I'm saying it because it's awesome. I like it. I also have a homemade one that does not look like that. Looks like the Clampets built it. I hope no Clampets are watching. Um, and I also got some different, uh, some of the different wheels for some of the uh, real short cases up to the 7 mag stuff. 338 Lapua, things like that. Um, they also make kits for these that'll go up to 50 BMG, uh, the Shy Tax, things like that. They don't show the kits on their website because they're certainly not in popular demand, but they do make them. And if you just send them an email or give them a call, um, they've got them in stock. They'll send them to you. So that was pretty cool. Oh, let's see here. Um, how do I work up a load with a Magnum primer uh, from... So what I do is I, I kind of start a, a little bit on the low end of the charge scale. Uh, you know, if, if the book is saying, you know, the minimum is, you know, whatever, 40 grains, the maximum is 46 grains, I'll start somewhere down around 42, 41 and work my way up. Um, and, but it's been my experience, and I probably almost shouldn't say this out loud, it's been my experience that they actually don't create much more pressure at least pressure signs that I can see. So that's sort of how I do it. It's it's really not rocket science. I just play it a little bit safer, that's all. <laughs> yes, contracts do ruin a lot of things. Yes, they do. Mr. Mopar Madman, you are correct, sir. Uh, put it up against the amp. Okay, so uh, Mopar Madman has... He's got the amp annealer, and we've talked a little bit about this. And yes, what I would like to do is I would like to just anneal a couple of uh, just some old 243 brass or 7mm brass or something I got laying around, send those to you with a couple of extra ones so that you can anneal them and mark them and send them back. And we'll just sort of maybe you and I both could do some sort of a little video shoot. Uh, just look at how they compare. I think that'd be pretty Um, so my buddy's rifle build, how's it going? Well, it's not. Oh, I hope I didn't lose you guys. Everything seized up. Um, 
Oh, there it goes again. So uh, the hmm. can you guys still hear me? Okay, see me? Okay, still keep getting all these little air things up here. Okay, sounds like everything's still coming through. Okay, sorry about that. It just keeps throwing me little error codes on my screen here, and everything just I get the big working signal. But all right, I'll just keep uh, I'll just keep talking. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, so my buddy's rifle build. It's it's really honestly it's just not going yet. Um, he works in the oil field. He's back in Williston, North Dakota, and they put him on for like fifty days straight, and so he's uh. Uh, you know, he, I don't get to see him that often and I, I, both of us are itching to get this thing going. And so we will, it's just, it's taken longer than we'd hoped, but we'll get the whole video series shot on that thing. And I'll post it just like I did with the Ackley build, you know, little pieces at a time as we go through it. it it'll be, uh, a lot of it'll be very, very similar. Um, though I don't know what type of stocks and stuff he's going to buy. Uh, speaking of stocks, uh, so we, you know, it, stocks are kind of a kind of a touchy subject, but let's see here. Let me scroll back up here and find this. Uh, oh no, I can't find it. Anyways, uh, somebody just wrote in about uh, talking about the stocks, and uh, yes, there are um, there are some great stocks out there. I've been pretty happy with the Boyd stock, HS Precision stocks. I do like those. Um, you know, but there's, I mean, there's Macmillan stocks and Bell and Carlson. And I think the biggest thing with a the stock, there's, there's really, there's two big things. There's three big things. The stock cannot touch the barrel. The stock has to accept the, um, the action, you know, nice and tight, usually with some glass bedding, some filler bedding, things like that, or aluminum bedding. And more importantly, uh, or at least equally importantly, the stock has to fit you. If you're not comfortable on that stock, uh, you're constantly trying to climb all over it, trying to find that that sweet spot where you're, you know, semi comfortable. And I think more shots are thrown by not being comfortable on a stock than, you know, other things. So, you know, you can argue the weight of a stock or the style of a stock, or you can argue all kinds of stuff. But as long as that action is locked in and you're comfortable with it, you're going to make better shots because a lot of it really just boils down to the shooter. Uh, would I trade my progressive press or keep it, uh, my, my Lee Loadmaster, would I swap it out for something else? You know, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm quite happy with it. It's a nice, it's a really nice stock, or uh, not stock, it's a very nice uh, progressive press. They are a little bit finicky. Um, there are some things you can tweak with them where you can sort of, you know, work them out. And, and once you get that thing rolling, I did like 100 rounds of uh, 223 the other day and it was, uh, gee, I did them in like 20 minutes. I mean, it was just, you know, and I didn't even have the big hopper set up yet. So it was pretty fast. Uh, <clears throat> so ideas for starting points on your buddy's uh, build would be a Savage 12 FB in 6.5 Creedmoor, just like your 308 turned into the 243 Ackley. Um, yeah, we are, well... I don't know for sure if we're going to use the Savage 12 FV or if we're going to use um, possibly the Savage Target Action. Uh, I'm not sure yet. That's that's still kind of in discussion, but it's possible that, that it's probably either one of those two. It could be a Model 10, but probably not. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, that was for from half dollar. And. Oh man, the comments! Holy smokes! Sorry, guys, I'm trying to keep up. Oh, seriously, considering an aftermarket chassis, worth it or stick with the tra traditional stock? So it's worth it 
if you're not comfortable with that stock or it's not locked in or the or the stock is touching the barrel uh, a lot of the cheesy factory barrels touch the stock they put pressure or, or the, the the stock puts pressure on the barrel and anytime there's contact when you start shooting that barrel heats up and the pressure from the stock starts to push the barrel we actually a, a friend of mine uh, he had a 7 mm Reming or a Ruger and uh, it had a wood stock and the the stock was touching the barrel. Two shots would print right next to each other, and the third shot could literally be 10 inches away because that, that after that second shot, the barrel heated up just enough to where it would just throw it. So it was it was crazy, and we, we figured that out, but uh, it wasn't hard to figure out, but we, we got that fixed, and it shot much better after that. Um, So how do I determine length of pull? Um, you know, I, I don't put too much effort into length of pull, honestly. Uh, you know, what, what they say is supposed to be my length of pull uh, is like 13 and a half inches or 13 and three quarter inches. Um, but I'm actually much more comfortable with a, with a shorter stock. So um, when I built my second Savage, the, when, I, when I built my Ackley and I ordered the stock from Boyd's, um, I ordered a much shorter stock, and so that uh, and it, it, it is much more comfortable for me. I, I do like it. So don't don't put too much weight into the you know into what people say about that. Just find one that fits you best and is comfortable. Um, the Accu stock and the aluminum bedding system, uh, I like those. I think they're just fine. Um, nothing wrong with them at all. Uh, I've seen a couple models uh, where, well, not necessarily models, but a couple of them where up toward the fore end, uh, right up toward the end of the stock, they've got, uh, they're really, really close to the barrel. So just pay attention to that when you buy one. And you can always, uh, you can always do a little skim bedding in there too and, and help straighten those out. That, that sometimes works. Oh. Oh, now we're talking about free bore with the ELD bullets. Um, you know, 0 0.104 free bore. I'm, I'm hesitant to even get into that because everybody's gun is different. And it's really hard for me to sit here and say yes or no uh, until, until you really see what the gun, you know, Take all the measurements, get out and shoot it, what's accurate, what's not accurate, and make adjustments from there. Sorry, Randy, I, I, I wish I could be a little bit more helpful, but um, I also don't want to uh, say too much about that. Like I said, just every gun's different, and um, you know, it's like telling somebody to seat the bullets five thousandths into the lands. Uh, where that works for most of my guns, it, it, it could blow somebody else's gun up. So, uh, especially when you're talking, you know, charge, charge weights and things. So anyways, just, um, I, I'm going to steer from that one. Sorry. So yeah, uh, West Desert Shooters talking about, uh, comparing stocks across factory rifles. Um, and one of the reasons he bought the Tika over the Hawa and I've got a Tika, uh, T3, in the gun safe and it's uh that tk is a very comfortable gun do i see any difference between the model 10 and the model 12 um uh no not not necessarily i don't um not enough to to be concerned about at least uh model 10 is a great action uh you can uh you can really build some tack drivers off of those um I work with a guy who's got uh, several Model 10s, and he's built a lot of really good, uh, really good rifles off of those, just tack drivers. So, you know, if you already have a 10, uh, build something with it, or just shoot it factory or whatever. But they're, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with a Model 10. They're, they're great. Model 10, Model 11, Model 12, um, they're, they're all good. The, the Savage Target action, um, you know, as long as you just... Uh, you know, do your homework, set it up right. That's the biggest thing is setting it up right. And the key to ac accuracy, it really is in the heart of the barrel. You know, you got to have a good barrel. And I, I got, uh, uh, I got a message today about uh, talking about barrels a little bit too. And, um, 
you know, I, I'm a Schillen guy, and, you know, there's Bartland Barrels and Hart and, you know, Lilja and, and McGowan, and there's a ton of them out there. Um, and, you know, I don't have experience with all of them. I've shot a lot of them that other people have owned, but uh, I think uh, any, any aftermarket barrel manufacturer typically is going to be, a, you know, going to have a, a leg up on, on a factory barrel. Um, not, not always, but, but in most cases. Just the, you know, the fit and finish quality is a little bit higher. You know, a lot of them are, are hand lapped. You know, they're just, uh, they're, they're just, they're just a little nicer. No, I have not done any timing. Uh, the question here is, have you ever done any timing on a Savage Action? Is it difficult to do? Um, have a heavy bolt throw and want to clean it up? Uh, no, on, you know, most of the Savage Actions I've had uh, are just, they're just spot on. So I don't have to worry about anything goofy like that. Um, uh, that's, well, I guess that sums it up. Yeah, hey, I got company now. Gone Commando says, have you ever used Ed's Red and would you recommend it? No, I have not used it, so I don't know if I could recommend it, but I'm going to write it down and look it up because I don't even know what that is. Well, my partner in crime will look this up. <laughs> Finally home from work now. The door closed. Jack says hello. Hello, Jack. Oh, <laughs> uh, a bore cleaner. Hmm. No, I'll, uh, I'll look into that a little bit more and see what I think, though I don't do a lot of cleaning on my boards. Uh, I prefer to leave them fairly copper fouled. I get uh, better consistency, and I'm just not a big fan of running home and scrubbing out the barrels every time. I used to. I used to, you know, I used to preach it, um, but I don't do it anymore. Uh, after watching some of the Taborosaurus Rex stuff uh, and putting it to the test myself, uh, he, he was right. I should take a look and see what else we've got on the menu. Oh, so here's this. Um, I'm going to throw this out here. I, I Believe it or not, I actually had quite a few people, uh, had a lot of people either send me a message, leave a comment, or send me an email asking me to do a Reloading for Dummies series. I think we're looking at just the absolute basics, people that don't know... Uh, a lot, maybe possibly a lot of the terminology when you're talking about, you know, case stretch and where's the, the head, the shoulder, the neck, the primer, um, just some of the real basic stuff. And so what's everybody's opinion? Would everybody, you know, I, I know a lot of the folks that are watching this are probably already reloading, but there's a lot of people that are watching that are just getting into it. And so um, anybody, uh, you know, give me a thumbs up or a thumb, well, don't give me a thumbs up yes or no on the Reloading for Dummy series. I think we're going to do it anyways, but uh, but we'll see. The story behind it is neat. Gone Commando says there's a story behind the gun cleaning solution. And it uses automatic transmission fluid. Automatic transmission fluid. That's got some, some high detergent in there. Kerosene, mineral spirits, and acetone. We'll see. <laughs> uh, Jack, how often do I clean my barrels? Jack wants to know. I clean the barrels now when my shot group starts to open up or when I check my, uh, my velocities, because I do check them from time to time. When I start to see a variation in my velocities or my shot groups open up, I'll come home and, and clean the barrel. And I'll clean it really good. And then I'll start over. But I us usually have to go out and start doing some fouling and stuff, so... Um, my gun doesn't shoot until it's fouled. All, almost all of my guns don't shoot until they're fouled. So, 
but that's actually pretty common. That's that's not uncommon. In fact, a lot of people who clean their barrels uh, excessively and then complain because the gun doesn't shoot, if they would just you know get 50, 60, 100 rounds down the barrel, uh, chances are is it actually tighten up. Oh, uh, let's see here. What is the round count that you would clean the bore? Can you read the comments? What is the round count that you would clean the bore? When is it too dirty? Also, how many rounds until you get the best accuracy? Okay, so that is that is rifle by rifle. That is not um, there. There, unfortunately, Tyler, there is no standard answer for that. Um, I've had some groups that tighten up after 10 shots, and I've had some groups on other rifles that tighten up after 50 shots or even 100 shots. And I've heard of people that don't get a tight group till they hit almost 200 rounds. So that's a real, that's a, that's a tough one. To, that's almost impossible to answer. You just have to take your guns out and see what they do. You know, get them, clean them, foul them, see what happens. I only have access to a 100-yard range from Joe Rochester. What's your suggestion for load development? Most I have read, say, ladder at 2 300. 2 to 300. No, yeah. do your ladder test at 100. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing a ladder test at 100 yards. I do all my ladder tests at 100 yards. Uh, you know, a, an MOA is an MOA, whether that is at uh, at 100 yards or 200 yards. You know, it's an inch at 100, inch at 200. Well, it's actually 1.047. Um, but the problem is when you start getting out to further ranges, you have the external ballistics, wind, and bar barometric pressures and stuff that start to have an effect on the bullet where testing a true ladder test is going to be very hard to do. So stick to 100 yards. That'd be my recommendation. That's what I do. Uh, half dollar 86. I do not reload. I shoot factory ammo. We're building a new house and I'm building a gun room in the basement and plan to get into reloading in the next six to eight months so the timing would be perfect. A gun room? Can I move in? No, I'll stay here. He can move in. <laughs> I'll keep the safe and the, and the reloading bench out in the garage. Uh, Stunner 1911, I only have full length sizing dies, getting ready to buy one of the Savages and try more precision shooting. Should I go ahead and get neck sizer call? The call it, call, call it, it die. Dies. Sorry. Okay, um, I've got a lot of neck sizing dies, I've got the bushing dies, um, I've got the standard neck sizing dies, and I've got the call it die. And if you look up Fortune Cookie 45, Lee call it, he does a comparison from some of the most expensive dies out there, and the Lee Collet die, it just rocks. That thing is awesome. And I switched everything back over to the Lee Collet dies. Every, everything. I don't, uh, if anybody would like to buy my bushing dies for 7mm and 243, I gladly sell them to you, but you won't be happy with the performance. So the Lee Collet die, best bang for your buck. And that thing's cheap too. Lee, Lee products are good products, and they're not expensive. They're not the price of Redding and, you know, RCBS competition dies. I'm not saying I don't run some of that stuff. I do. But when it comes to the call-it die, just get the Lee. West Desert Shooter, just to say something, I'm not ignoring your comments either. I'm <laughs> just trying to keep up, so bear with me. I've been working like 14 days in a row. Um, let's see. Phil Tong, reloading would be good for beginners. It's a great place to start is the beginning. Half dollar eighty six. Yep. He's still for sale. I'll, we can swap out parts if you want to keep him in your <laughs> gun room downstairs. Um, feel free. Uh, Joe Rochester, thanks for all the answers. Nice to get some feedback. So, what's your snuff of choice? No, oh, my snuff of choice would be to quit snuff. Quit snuff would be a great answer. Not really what he's doing, but it's grizzly yeah, wintergreen. So. Grizzly or skull wintergreen. Sorry. It's gross. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't get a lot of points for that. But, no. yeah. Jack Hoff, do you ever use OCW and OBD tests for your workups? Well, now people are throwing acronyms at me that I'm not familiar with. OCW and OBT, uh, what exactly are you referring to? See, this is part of the problem with the <laughs> some of the gun community, too, is everybody has different terminologies, and some of you probably know those, and some of you probably don't. Apparently, I'm some of the people that don't. We could make up some great acronyms. Right. While we're on dies, what's your thoughts on the match seating dies with a micro adjustment? So what I run is the RCBS competition seater die, and I like that one. Um, any of them are pretty good. It's just nice to be able to uh, 
uh, be able to index that. If you need to come down, you know, uh, eight thousands, you can just turn it eight thousands, and it's going to move that bullet eight thousands. So it's um, yes, but you know, and they're actually they're all pretty good, really, uh, as far as the as those types of seating dies. Um, you don't need to break the bank, you know, buying a two hundred and fifty dollar Redding. You can if you want. It's a good die. But uh, I just run the competition uh, RCBS die, and it, it works very, very well. Joe Rochester, I can't agree more. We wives have a club for that, you know. What? He said all wives hate, ha ha. Oh. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, let's see. Jack Hoff says optimal charge weight and optimal bullet timing is what those acronyms are. Oh, oh, oh. Um, optimal charge, so... Do I use an optimal charge weight? Well, I mean, yes. Yes, I do. Um, the charge weight is what my gun shoots the best. And you, you'll find that through just testing variations of, of uh, powder charges. You know, if, it's, if the starting is 40 and the top is 45, you're going to find a sweet spot in there somewhere. When you start to find the sweet spot with the charge, that's when you start playing around with the bullet seating depth and dial that in a little bit further. That seems to work the best for me. There are some other methods out there, but I'm just letting you know that's, that's what works for me, so. Uh, let's see, Joe Rochester, mine is in it. Well, yeah, we have meetings. I think she's the secretary. I'm just the treasurer, but Tyler Griffin, has your wife always been okay with you spending a lot of time shooting and reloading? <laughs> uh, that's a catch-22, sir. Um, if he buys I, me really cool stuff to I, go play with, too. I think, honestly, how this works is uh, she doesn't care if I shoot and hunt and reload and stuff. It's it's the cost of everything. <laughs> That's where things get sketchy. Well. <laughs> when somebody says, I need a new rifle and I come home with three, eh, you know. Well, you know, he said I was going to go buy a twenty two, and the next thing I know is we all had twenty twos, and I said, well, we can't shoot. More than one at a, one time, so... Ta-da! Yeah, but... <laughs> do I mind? Not really. Sometimes it's a little overwhelming, but, you know, it's a hobby that he enjoys, and it's a hobby that I enjoy, so can I get really mad? No, that's like somebody getting mad at somebody who golfs. Um, you know, you spend time and money on all kinds of hobbies, so... Pick um, your poison. They all cost money and time. And again, when he buys me great stuff, you know... Yes, yes, Tyler, you should buy your wife something when you buy something. What I do though is I buy my I buy like a new AR and then I then I buy her an AR. So, now we have ARs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Depends on the day with your wife, West Desert Shooter. Is that any day that ends with a Y or do you have other days that are better than others cuz you know, he could always take a few pointers if you have some. <laughs> Batteries are savage MK heavy barrel with thumb hole. Oh yeah. Mine, well, I bet that's a nice shooter, Joe. Mine is the shotgun that you put the the different stock on. Yeah, we got her uh semi uh the Remington 1187 semi-auto and and I put the uh I put the thumb through on that so that she can shoot it. She broke her wrist a while back and doesn't have the doesn't have any movement in that right wrist anymore. So that really helped with uh just keeping that arm nice and straight when you're shooting. More like shooting a pistol than a shotgun. Right, right. I think West Desert Shooter's wife should be in our club, too. We could start a wives club. <clears throat> See what you've started? <laughs> you poor guys are going down. <laughs> um, the other question that somebody wrote in was, budget-friendly upgrades to increase accuracy in the... The best thing you can do to increase your accuracy is learn to reload and learn to really uh, get get those get those bullets dialed in. Find out what your barrel likes, what your gun likes, and learn to shoot. Um, learn the different shooting positions, how you're on the bench, how you're shooting prone, things like that. Uh, S. Turner, 1911. Majority of my rifles are mill serps. That way, when I'm walking. 
in or out with them. They all look the same. They don't all look the same, sweetie. We know. We know. We just don't say anything. We pick our battles. So we, we probably know. She probably knows. Yes, a wife sh shooting club. Just make sure you're further than 1,000 yards if you've done anything wrong. Oh, Joe, I've, I've, I've lost a, just a little bit of respect for you, buddy. See, we're Glock people. You got to yeah. watch out. Yeah, I, I, I do thoroughly enjoy my Glock. However, if I had a 1911, yeah. I know somebody would buy it. His name's Joe. Yeah, well. <laughs> no, they're all right, Joe. I'm just, I'm just joking around. But we are Glock people. I, I don't. Uh, ergonomically, the 1911s don't work for me very well. That's kind of like the first one I started out with was that Beretta. Yeah. 15, 15 safeties later, I could actually pull the trigger and shoot something. <laughs> um. So just in case uh, Me Too on Tube is watching this later, uh, he was asking about, uh, he or she, I'm not sure, was asking about night vision and thermal technology, and um, I've been doing some research on it. I don't have any experience, personal experience with it that, on stuff that I own, um, but uh, it's, it's coming up. I have reached out to a company, and we've been talking a little bit about uh, getting some of that stuff to test, but we've got no commitments yet, so... If you watch this later, um, that's kind of where I stand on that. I just don't have the experience with that type of stuff. That would be spam. Really? Somebody's got time to spam it, huh? Oh, yeah. I had one earlier, too. Well, there's your answer for the Reloading 101 series. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right, Gone Commando. So, uh... We need a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> I was moderating, Joe. I still said I loved you still. Can <laughs> <Damn>, that guy. <laughs> I'll beat him up for you later, Joe. It's all fine. I could tell him no. That'll also be the same thing. You know. So one more thing that we're going to look at here that is in some upcoming videos... So we picked up a couple of these. Uh, these are Olympic arms. They're actually made about... I don't want to poke you in the head with don't that. Don't poke me in the head with that. They're actually made just a couple miles from the house. Um, they've been in business. They're the second longest manufacturer of ARs in the world. Um, they're, and they're, they're actually quite good. They did have a short time there where they, they had a couple issues. They got those resolved right away. So um, this one here is uh, chambered in 223. Um, I've also got the 6.8 SPC. Oh. Um, oh, sweet. Joe says we can get a moderator on YouTube that gets rid of spat and bad chats. Nice. Um, so this this particular gun here has got the Ultra Match. Uh, it's a stainless barrel. It's it's painted, but it's the Ultra Match uh, high twist barrel. So we're we're going to run this out and do some testing on that. Um, now, Olympic Arms is in the process of transferring ownership. Um, they're pretty tight-lipped on who the new people are, so I tried to get it out of them, but they, they wouldn't bite. So that's all right. We'll, uh, uh, we'll put this to the test, but it's uh, um, these are pretty nice, so pretty happy with it. Just pretty happy with it? Pretty happy with it. We'll, we got to dial it in first. Oh, okay. All right, um, I'm going to go through my list and see what, make sure I didn't miss anything. So we got that one, got that one, got that one, got that one, uh, got that one. Addressing that one later, got that one, budget friendly, got that one. And uh, Martin wrote in and said uh, 17 WSM. And uh, Martin, if you catch this at any time, um, to be honest with you, I would love to uh, really get some experience with the 17s, but I don't have any experience with the 17s right now. Um, in fact, I don't even have any friends that own 17s right now. Well, I do. One guy in Yakima that uh, that I talked to, he's uh, he's got one, but that's a couple hours away from me, so I don't run over and shoot it. But um, So what else? Uh, Jack Hoff wants to know, what did it run? Um, 
What did it run to start with, or what did it run when we ended up? See, I was going to go down, Jack, and just get get a one, one and, and then I, now I have three. That's See how this works? <laughs> um, and I did that in, in a week. I bought three in a week. Uh, that rifle, because they are transferring ownership, they are selling out all of their stock right now. Uh, they're not producing anything more until the new owners take over. I bought that rifle, and I bought her AR for 1200 bucks, both of them. Uh, two rifles for $1,200, and then I went back, and actually, I take that back. I bought the 6.8 SPC and her 5.56 five, for 1200 and then I went back and just bought that upper. So, um, And... Phil says, uh, love my 17. You know, I've heard a lot of people say they really like them. And uh, I I suspect they're pretty good. I just don't have any experience with them. But I've heard, I've, I've not heard anything bad, unless you try to go long range. Then I, I hear horror stories, because they're just such a small bullet. But that's all right. Uh, Joe Rochester, he can't be too, I think you meant excited about a rifle. Then the wives get angry. Well, you better only have one wife. Wives is plural. <laughs> Joe, I'm not letting him do that. That's a whole nother adventure, wouldn't that be? But see, Joe, if you if you seem just a little upset about some of the rifles, you know, well, it's okay, but, you know, could really use an upgrade. Uh, you know, see how you work this, Joe? <laughs> I just gave away this. So many wives out there are going to kill you guys now? No, we're going to start the Wives Club. <laughs> oh, right, then we'll just right, chase right. after you. You know, yeah. I said, you got a thousand yards to go before I can't, you know, can't get it on paper at least, so. And he can get excited about rifles. Yeah, I can. Scary, so, yeah. I do like to go shopping at Cabela's, so. Yeah, we've got a Cabela's like two miles down the road, too, yeah, so that's that, pretty cool. That's, that's, well, cool or scary, yeah. depending on the day. So what else can we, what else do you guys want to talk about? Anything, uh, anything in particular that uh, you need some information on or want to see in the upcoming episodes or... Have you, uh, Randy Roth, have you had any experience with Athlon Optics? Athlon Optics. <laughs> so, Randy, funny story. Uh, I reached out to them a year ago, and uh, they they just blew me off. Um, I, I wasn't I was not impressed with that. So, no, I don't. Uh, you know, they're they're a relatively new. Uh, optics company and I, I really wanted to get my hands on one just to test it and you know and they you know and you know I, I get it too I don't want to come down on them too hard they're they're a new company so you know they probably don't have the product to just send out but I, w I would like to get my hands on one and test one. Phil Tong have you had or have you decided on the 6.5 Creedmoor build? Uh, Phil I have not uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is my buddy's build and he's off in the oil field right now, so we'll uh, we'll we'll get to that. But it's it's taken a little bit longer than we thought. So, Joe Rochester, I live at around 2,300 foot elevation. I'm shooting a Savage 10 243. We have temperature swings from 90 Fahrenheit to around 20 Fahrenheit in the winter. What is your recommended powder for consistency? Um, I recommend running the powder that your gun shoots the best. And then I recommend that you go out and you shoot it at 90 degrees and 20 degrees. And I and, and every 10 degrees, so from, from 20, you know, 30, 40, up to 90, and record all of those shots. And build yourself a chart on the muzzle velocity of those. And then do all your calculations off of that. And then you can interpolate between, you know, if you were shooting at 40 degrees and in between 40 and 50, you can sort of interpolate that number uh, of what it would be at 45 degrees. So that is the best way to do it. Um, I found that the extreme powders aren't much more extreme than the non-extreme. And, uh, you know, you have other things like, uh, you know, the, the, the viscosity in the barrel with the copper fouling and, and things just, it's not just about the powder. It, it's got a lot to do with just how things work at different temperatures. So the best way to do it, the most accurate way to do it, is to go out and record those those uh, muzzle velocities, and, and that's what I that's what I always do. I just go out and shoot cold, shoot hot, and uh, and check the temperature of the gun 
in the action and down the barrel, and also check the temperature of the ammunition. The temperature of the ammunition is the most important. Now, if you have a hot chamber and you throw a cold bolt, cold case in there, and you chamber it, and you take 20 seconds before you pull the trigger, the temperature of that ammunition just went up, and now you're shooting it at a completely different temperature than you think you are. So that's very important. Um, but you really want to just make sure that you're, you're actually checking, you know, like every 10, 10 degrees. All right, West Desert Shooter, I bet if Mrs. Von Precision did some shooting <laughs> videos, more girls might open up to go shooting a possible series. Yeah, we've talked about yeah, that. we have. Um, Unfortunately, I'm in my super busy time of the year for work, and it's something that I want to go out and do. We've we've actually talked about um, doing some reloading classes or reloading videos for uh, mm -hmm. lady shooters and, and some different options I, I like that. Um, it is in the mix. It is yep. in the in the near future. Hopefully, I can get some more out. It's just finding the time to actually get out there where I'm not getting called back in. Um, so stay tuned for that. That's happening. Yep. Uh, Jack Hoff. With just getting into precision shooting, any pointers on fundamentals to work on first? Your breathing. Yeah. Work on your breathing. Patience. Patience and work on a very, very steady trigger pull. Um, and yet there's some good videos out there on where you place the trigger on your finger to pull it. You don't want it too far in and you don't want it at the very, very tip. You want it right in the center of that pad and pulling it straight back toward you. And you want to make sure you're gripping that rifle, not hard, but to where the pull is back and it's not gripped funny and pushing it, you know, off to one side or the other. But breathing is probably the most important. Uh, you'll get the best shots on an exhale at the bottom of the exhale when your body is completely still, minus your heartbeat. You can always watch that in the scope. But, uh, and then right at the bottom of your breath, Watch your heartbeat and snap the trigger. For Rochester, is there a decent budget chrono? I think he means chronograph. Chronograph, yes. Um, probably the best chronograph out there is the Magneto Speed. And if you look back through our history, um, I've got a I've got a couple of them that I that I use. Um, one of them is uh, uh, Caldwell, and then I've got the Magneto Speed. The thing I like about the Magneto Speed is I don't have to set it up. I don't have to worry about if it's raining. I don't have to, you know, get the tripod out, all that stuff. It just slips on the end of the barrel, little strap, pull the trigger, and you got it. The downside to the chronograph is you cannot shoot for groups because it changes the harmonics of the barrel. And so you'll notice that your groups are going to open up a little bit, um, but all you're looking for is speed. So um, my best recommendation would be the uh, Magneto Speed Sporter model. They're... Uh, they're not budget. They're about 170 bucks. Um, the V3 version, which comes with a little nicer display unit and um, some different things, uh, it can fit some different barrels a little bit better. Um, those are uh, those are about oh, well, they're over 300, but but they're nice and they work. I want to go back. I want to I want to do a go back to Jack Hoff with this question into getting into precision shooting. Okay. Patience. Everything's going to go wrong the first little bit. Yeah, that's just, true. Just be willing to keep trying. I've I've seen him get super mad and super excited all in the same half an hour. So patience pays off. Yeah. Mopar Madman, you're right. Magneto Speed is super worth it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, ever since I bought one of those, I am sold on it. It's uh, And, you know, it's a small... It's a small unit. You can throw it in your backpack. You can take it up in the mountains, out to the desert, wherever you're at. You don't, uh, you know, so it's even if you were, uh, we, we hunt uh, Utah. We got some property down in Utah. And when we go down there and hunt, the cabin sits at 8,500 feet. We're at sea level right here. And to be able to just run up there, strap that thing onto the end of the barrel, pull a couple shots, and, and just verify my, my data before I, you know, before I go running after a deer or something, uh, that's a uh, very, very functional, uh, just lightweight. It's, it's just a good deal. You just can't beat them. But again, you just can't shoot for groups. That's all. Jack Hoff's talking about his MOAs. Uh, just now getting consistent two MOAs, sometimes one MOA, one MOA out of my 5.56, five, uh, drop down to a 2.23. Um, and it's really going to depend on what bullet weight you're shooting, what barrel twist you have in that gun. Um, that's probably your your biggest issue if you're shooting two MOA. That thing should shoot 
under a, uh, under a minute easy. Uh, you're just going to have to find the, the right bullet and uh, match that with your twist rate. Mark Man says reloading without a chronograph is like shooting blind. It, it is, too. It is shooting blind. You have no idea. If you don't know what that bullet's doing coming out speed-wise, you know, 50 feet per second over 1,000 yards makes a large difference. Um, so, yeah, you got to figure that out. So, yeah, if, uh, Jack, do you have any idea what... Uh, what twist rate you're in you, speed you, you have in that barrel and what you're shooting out of it? Half dollar eighty six. Off subject here, but has anyone ever had to mail a gun back to Savage? If so, how long did it take to get it back? I've never sent one back to Savage. I sent no. one back to Remington. Remington, and I'll probably yeah um, never. Yeah, right. That was not a good experience. Uh, with yeah. Savage, no. Personally, I have not. I don't know if anybody else on here has, but I never have had a. I've never had to do that. So um, Savage is a pretty decent. They're they're a good company. Yeah. I've called them several times uh, with some questions on some different things, and uh, you actually pick up the phone. There's somebody to talk to. They answer your question. The hold time was was good. I mean, it, you know, I wasn't sitting on hold for an hour, so that was nice. Uh, just a couple minutes, maybe at, at the most. Uh, if anybody else here has ever had to send one back to Savage, uh, write a comment, uh, good or bad, I guess. Well, I think we're probably just about out of time. We've been at this for an hour now. Uh, one and eight twist, 20 inch barrel. This is from Jack. Uh, 23 wild shooting 75 grain Hornady black. Um, Jack, you you got a good combination. One and eight twist, 20 inch barrel, uh, 75 grain. That's uh, that certainly is enough to stabilize it. So I'm not sure what uh, you know. You probably just need to to do some precision reloading. That's probably what it boils down to. Trying different powders, uh, different seating depths. You know, you could seat them out to the length of the mag. Uh, you know, leave yourself a little wiggle room, but uh, that that could help you out. Uh, it also might not like Hornady bullets. You know, you could always try some Sierras too. Yeah, a few of mine don't like some of those combinations, but a few of his like. So yeah, yeah, it just really boils down to the harmonics and you know what it likes and doesn't like. So yeah, you might want to try a couple different things. Um, uh, maybe drop down to like a 69 grain Sierra. Those are usually spot on, and that twist rate would stabilize that very well. Back to that fundamentals on reloading is frustrational groups when you can't. Oh yeah. <laughs> when you can't find the right powder and bullet. Oh, mix. I've 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 gone through pounds of different powders and boxes and boxes of different bullets trying to find that magic combination before, and it's. Uh, it gets a little easier the further you go because you gain a lot of experience on what powders work in certain things and what's, which ones don't work so good in different bullets. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's trial and error. Yeah, Mopar Madman, you're, that's, that'd be a good combo. Sierra Match King and Varget. Varget's a good powder. <laughs> Yeah, Jack, 95% of it probably is you. <laughs> uh, I just, always say we should hit the range more, too, but that's just because <coughs> we like being out there. Yeah. Uh, Brady Downing, have you tried out the Burger Classic Hunter hunting hybrid compound to the Z? Compared to the uh, yeah, BLDs? Oh, sorry, BLD. I've been working a lot. I know. Uh, no, I have not tried the hybrid yet. Um, i got a couple buddies that have loaded them up. And they've had some mixed results, but they're also in the infinite stages of working out those loads. So um, I've done a lot of VLD stuff, uh, whether it's the target or the hunting uh, styles. But uh, Jack Hoff says, I'm putting in my order, and after this video, we'll be loading my first rounds in a few weeks. Good for you. <laughs> uh, Gone Commando, thanks for the Q&A. Have a great evening. Thank you for watching. Randy Roth got kicked offline when you answered the... Okay, uh, Randy, I did not, I did not answer that because um, uh, every rifle is different, and I, I'm 
not going to get into the free bore. <laughs> I just read Phil Tong's comment. Um, it says I'm growing horns. No, I'm not. Those are really mine. That's what happens when you work too many days in a row and... Uh, and, and you're talking oh, about spending yeah, money. So, uh, yeah, that's a bad thing. We'll change yeah. that next time. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, half dollar D6, my 1 and 8 does better with lighter than 75. Yeah, I yeah. mine do too. Yeah, 69 is kind of a magic number. Um, you know, when you're looking at 75 grain, 1 and 7 is probably a, a little bit better. 1 and 7 it's twist, but that's all right. right. Yeah, if right. If I move this way, I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Tong, get off the floor. It's probably dirty down there. Uh, Stunner 1911, Jack Hoff, my 223, Wild Likes 52 to 69 grain have been the best woods. The 1 and 8 bullets are Nosler with Varget powder. Yeah. I'll get some loads worked up uh, on my 223 and let you guys know. Uh, we'll probably do another live Q&A in mid to late August. Uh, bear hunting opens August 1st here, so I'll be out chasing bears through the woods. Um, but uh, I think we're going we're gonna to log off for tonight. It's uh, 7 o'clock here, and it's been a long couple weeks. She's worked like 14 days straight now, so thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, all right, folks. Um, I think we're going to call it quits, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. It, it was fun, and uh, sorry for recording myself on the couch earlier. Uh, I, I was trying to get this thing set up to go to go live, and I and I hit the Stream Now button. I didn't realize it. When you hit the Stream Now button, you stream now. Yeah, and then I was laying on the couch, like, pushing buttons, and I'm like, <laughs> He's normally on the couch, <laughs> pushing buttons. Great shows are awesome. Gotta run. Wife just got home. Hide all the guns you just bought. Half dollar eighty six. <laughs> Good session. Catch you. Love your channel. Ten p.m. here, Mopar man. Man, you're up late. Wow, yeah, that's past my bedtime. Yeah, go bed. <laughs> Jack Hoff sounds good. Thanks, guys. Well, we appreciate everybody watching. All right. We'll be back soon. Yep. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you. I gotta figure out how to shut this down. Last time I was still streaming live, he's like, "You're still live." Oh. I'm pushing the button. I okay. think it's over here. Oh. Or I gotta hit stop streaming. Stop streaming. We're out. All right.